Focus Tire Information Whiskey 21530. Wind 060 at 5. Mike Juliet, this is Archer Radar Contact. Hazardous weather information from Minnesota available on flight service frequency. You've dialed in the Flying Midwest Podcast. Connecting aviators from across America's heartland. Sharing news, information, and events from around the region. Calling Nancy Vincent to Nogi Tower, Roger. Turn left heading 070, runway 9 crew for takeoff. Sit back, relax, and join our crew for some hangar talk as we discuss a wide variety of regional aviation topics. And now, from our home at the Anoka County Blaine Airport, our checklist is complete and we're ready for departure for another episode of the Flying Midwest Podcast. What is going on, everyone? Jim here with the Flying Midwest Podcast. So happy you're able to join us. On this episode, we're joined by Jason Jensen, conservation officer and pilot with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. He talks to us about the unique missions of the DNR. And as always, news, information, and events from around the region with some friendly hangar talk along the way. So strap in and let's take off into this episode of the Flying Midwest Podcast. Hey, Jim. Hello, Trevor. Hi, Maddie. Hi, Trevor. Guess Hello. where I am at? Where? My office for a change. <laughs> wow. That is correct. Um, for everyone who has not seen the social media posts, Trevor is back home finally after 10 plus months at different Air Force bases around the country. I got to I got to I got to make a correction. OK, go ahead. Nine months, 25 days. Not that I was counting. Of course. Now, not. Why Why would you be while well, you're living in a trailer away from your house? Away from his office. Yeah. Well, congratulations to you, Trevor. A lot of work that you put into that coursework. And I can't imagine doing it myself. It looked very grueling. Some of the <laughs> stuff we talked about with your coursework and the, just the sheer numbers and the stuff you have to know. So congratulations, man. Well deserved. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll see if it's deserved or not. That's to be determined. Well, here's the deal, Trevor. You've been away for way too long. Uh, Maddie and I talked about this before we started the episode. Um, you need a reintegration quiz to bring you back into the fold of the Midwest. So if you pass the quiz, you can stay. If you fail it, we're going to send you to remedial training. Kansas is not in the Midwest. <laughs> That's not the question. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> no, it's, we're allowing it. We read news from Kansas all the time, including mm-hmm. tonight, by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, So here's what we're going to do. It's just a few questions. Um, I'm going to spell some city names in the Midwest, and I want you to pronounce it. If you need to get a pen and paper so you can write it down, and then give me the correct pronunciation as a Midwesterner. Are you ready? (laughs) This is right up Trevor's alley. All right, um, because I'm going to start spelling. If you're not ready, it's on you. Go ahead. The first one, W-A-C-O-N-I-A. Waconia. That's one. The next one. D. Should I do these in phonetics? Just for funsies. Yes. All right. Let's see if this could also be a quiz of how well does Jim remember his phonetics? Delta. Uniform. Bravo. (laughs) Uniform. (laughs) Quebec. Uniform. Dubuque. Dubuque. Dubuque, Iowa. Nice job. That's, That's two. That's two. But well, we haven't job. got to the hard questions Trevor, you yet. Can count. Uh, the final uh, city that we'll have you pronounce: Mike, Alpha, November, Ida. That's uh, the, oh shoot! I, <laughs> you fail. India. I fail because I Manitowoc. see Manitowoc. It's, it's Manitowoc. I didn't even get to finish spelling it, but I fail because my civilian phonetics mixed with my military ones sometimes, and it gets me all screwed up. So you got Ida. Sorry. <laughs> Jim, I, I'm just sorry. I'm just curious. Um, what is the what? military alphabet? What do you mean? What? What do you mean the military? What do you mean? You said it was different. Oh, oh my Casper. Bravo, my hot Charlie, Delta, Echo, Foxtrot, Go. I don't think that's what she's looking for. She's just oh. asking what's no. the difference. There is a military and then there's like a civilian law enforcement. Oh, yeah. Acts, sorry. I'm and like, they law are different. So I mix them sometimes by accident. Well, you got three. 
three out of three. Does it mean I'm still part of Midwest? Uh, the, the next three questions are really the, okay, four questions. We'll seal the dealer. Five questions. Jesus Christ, you just keep on adding them up. Seven questions. No, five questions left. We have to be sure, all right? This is a big deal. You've been gone for a very long time. I've been a Midwesterner more than I've been gone. So. That's not the point. It can be just like that, taken away from you. Just because you failed my quiz. <laughs> I failed it. No, I'm saying if you fail the quiz, just just like that. All right, we got to get on with this quiz. We got hey. other things to talk about. This is this is a gimme. Um, what is it called? Hot dish or casserole? Hot dish, hands down. Okay. Um, the carbonated beverage with lots of like sugars in it. Pop. Okay. You're gonna go camping or to a lake. You're going. Wait, what? You're about to go camping somewhere, or you're going to a lake or a cabin. Or a cabin, or you're going. Coming? What? Where are you going? You coming? Well, sure. Are you inviting us? Where sure. are we going, though? Mm-hmm. Go to the cabin. All right. The correct answer is up north. That's or not. We also would have accepted up north. Up north. Ever... Up north. That's that. Yeah. No. I, I yep. object. You can object all you want. It's not your quiz. <laughs> this is also not a valid quiz to begin with. I. It's really it's hard a valid to say. Quiz. Who goes south? Tell me. Who goes I've gone south? south? Well, despite the call into really? question of the validity of this quiz, we're going to continue. Um, <laughs> you bump into somebody in a store. What do you say to him? Oh. Oh. Oh, pardon oh. me. Let me squeeze Sorry. right past you. <laughs> oh, pardon me. All right. The final question. And this is in honor of our DNR um, conservation officer for this episode. Um, you are out in the woods somewhere and you run across one of these small flowing water thingies with fish in them. What do you call that? Crick. There you go. Crick was the right answer. I also would have accepted Creek. Am I am I Midwesterner? You passed. Welcome yeah. back, Trevor. <laughs> You're gonna have to do the same thing for the, Maddie when she comes back up to Minnesota. That the Kansas is still in the Midwest. Still We've Midwest. Got over <laughs> Arkansas is technically in the Midwest, too. Oh, God, no, it's not. It's just Southern Midwest. It's not. It's Southern Midwest. No, I'm Southern Midwest. That's South. (laughs) Very South. Hey, Jim. Yes, Trevor. I got a question for you. Yeah, shoot. Rumor has it you're starting another podcast. Oh, that's true. Just briefly, I'm starting a podcast called Fly the Transition. It is about people's transition from other areas and walks of life into career fields in aviation and not just pilots. Um, I've got probably about 10 guests on the hook already, which is kind of humbling when I just put out some feelers, but I've got anything from airport managers. I've got helicopter pilots uh, that fly like uh, air ambulance stuff. Um, I've got a commercial pilot slash content creator. I've got a, um, a SIM instructor with an airlines. So for anyone concerned, the Flying Midwest podcast is not going anywhere. They're just different things. Um, it's a different way for me to explore storytelling. Um, but the Flying Midwest podcast is still very near and dear to me, as are Maddie and Trevor. And we have some exciting things in 2023. So we're still here. We're still going to have a good time. Speak for yourself. Trevor's going to sit here and be miserable. Me and Maddie are going to have a good time. And you can all listen. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's the podcast. That's the podcast. Strap in. That is... <laughs> That's a perfect summary of the Flying Midwest podcast. Honestly, you can't get much more accurate than that. So now that I've gotten that news out of the way, should we talk about some Midwest aviation news? Gee, we better. Uh, Globe Lair Charter's first tree planting completed by Minnesota DNR. This is actually kind of an interesting. Globe Lair Charter's is apparently they're, they're, they're planting trees uh, for reforestation. Um, they're partnering with the Minnesota DNR. Uh, confirmed that they've uh, they've planted about 6,000 bare root conifer seedlings, uh, 5,400 red pine and 600 jack pines um, back in May. The planting comprises of six acres of woodland near St. Croix State Forest. Salvatars harvesting cleared a lot of the, the wind damaged trees. So it creates a big space that they could go ahead and replant. It sounds like Global Air Charters will continue to per- uh, periodically update customers on their uh, future tree planting endeavors. But I think this is kind of an interesting story because it kind of adds to the uh, the dynamics, what is aviation. Off to you, Maddie. Over to Battle Creek, Michigan. There's a flight team out there called the Hooligans, and they fly uh, T-34 Mentors. It's a military trainer derivative of the uh, 35 Bonanza. Hmm. 
fascinating. The hooligans fly in all kinds of flight shows around the country and different ceremonies as well. Um, Their goal is to pay tribute to military veterans. This week, uh, Western Michigan University donated two of their mentors that were apparently just sitting in hangars. So they're obviously not airworthy, but they are uh, or will be used as a very valuable parts resource. So if anybody knows anything about warbirds, it's there they break a lot and parts are very, very hard to find because let's face it, manufacturers are either, have either been defunct or they haven't been made for years and years. So this will help the hooligans do what they do and continue to do so for a very long time. Their aircraft go through a lot of paces and they need uh, a lot of work done, a lot of parts. So this will be really great. Apparently the university got them in the early 2000s. And since then, they have just been in storage. So it's good that they are going to a new home and going to somewhere where they'll be used and used to a good cause. So that's pretty cool, I think. Going to Columbus, Ohio. So a man is facing charges related to a a drone spotted incident in uh, Ohio State, you know, Wisconsin game um, earlier in the season. So NBC4 obtained official affidavit records for the case. And apparently it details an officer's account of a uh, September 24th incident. Detectives from the Columbus Division of Police and Counterterrorism Unit said that they spotted the drone about 9 o'clock in the morning above the Ohio Stadium. The drone flew south and landed in one of the practice fields nearby. This is kind of interesting because... In my eyes, I think it's a good thing because drones are out of control. They're readily available. They are, and it doesn't take a a genius to fly one. It it takes a genius to fly one right, correctly. I can fly one correctly, and I'm not a genius. (laughs) It's true. I'm not a genius. Anyway. Ask around. All right, carry on. How about we talk about helicopters real quick? Okay. Over in my neck of the woods, we've been getting some uh, some hype lately. You know, things are happening. Textron is continuing to be its, its big thing. And according to the source, the Bell Helicopter Division of Textron has won the U.S. Army's future long-range assault aircraft contract, which could be worth up to $1.4 billion, which is kind of a big deal. Obviously, that's going to really benefit the workforce down here. That's just furthering national security and all that with this new um, this new helicopter that's going to be developed. Textron already has, and the Bell Division obviously already has their huge place that they have all their manufacturing and all that. So they're ready to take on that role for sure. A Spirit Aerosystems, which is down here, I don't know if you're familiar, but they do a lot of stuff. They do a lot of manufacturing as well. Um, they will produce a fuselage for this this new helicopter, which is said to replace the UH-60 Blackhawk by 2030. Uh, it's the called the, the Victor 280, so the V-280, and it'll provide the Army with enhanced speed, range, and agility. It looks kind of like an Osprey, but like slap, they slapped a V-tail on it, which is kind of cool. So it looks like a Blackhawk fuselage with a tilt rotor. Yeah. And a V-tail. Mm-hmm. I don't it's, like it's it. It's interesting. It looks it's, ugly. I mean, it doesn't... To me, it doesn't <clears throat> scream helicopter. It's It doesn't it's look a, like a helicopter. It's a tilt it's a, rotor. It's a tilt rotor, yeah. It's a... That's it for the news. How about the events? Well, Trevor, unfortunately, it is winter here in the Midwest, so not a whole lot of events to pick from this time around, but there is one. We do have an event coming up in Moose Lake, Minnesota. That is going to be occurring next weekend, December 17th, with an alternate of the 18th. You can braid the weather and join a group for the second annual Moose Lake Fly-In. Join them for ski and wheel winter weather flying. There will be a fire, chili, hot dogs and polo sausages, and a warming cabin to keep you nice and toasty warm off there on the lake. And speaking of the lake, that is where you'll be landing. The landing area will be on ice, so please plan your aircraft and your flight accordingly. More information can be seen on the Minnesota Pilots Association Facebook page, or you can check out supercub.org. There is a thread that will update weather conditions within that forum. So I will be sure to post that link for you in the show notes. And we know that we're in those lighter months when it comes to air shows, fly-ins, and other types of aviation events, but that doesn't mean they're not out there. And if you're hosting one, be it one of those wonder weather fly-ins or an educational event or anything else that you want to get some pilots together, share that information with us and we'll pass it along to our audience. You can contact us with that information on any of our social media accounts or email us at flyingmidwestpodcasts at gmail.com. That will do it for our news and events. Let's get on to our guests for this episode. Well, I was going to say we've got a really cool event tonight. 
We do have a cool event tonight. We learned something from the DNR. We do. Can you uh, believe we learned something on really. this podcast? Brilliant. Jim, would you would you mind telling us a little bit about tonight's guest? I sure will. Uh, tonight's guest is going to be Jason Jensen. He is a conservation officer pilot with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Uh, he's been with that agency since 1991, and he's been flying with them full time since 2011. So quite a number of years of experience under its belt. And he's going to talk to us tonight about the different mission platforms uh, within the DNR. So welcome to Jason. Hey, Jason. Hi, Jason. Hey, what do you know? Hey, Mr. Jensen, how are you doing, sir? Hello. I'm doing well. I, uh, the state equipment apparently uh, is finicky in its old age. Nothing but the best. I mean, it's government equipment, right? Uh, Nothing but the low bid. But I shouldn't say that. It it normally does good. There's probably a hint of operator error between all of us. <laughs> <laughs> so I do enjoy watching your uh, your podcast. Um, I'm going to try oh. and keep a little bit of water going because I have this talk through my nose. I don't yeah. have a radio voice. <laughs> so I'm going to try and we just lower it down an octave. Oh, okay. Yeah, we yeah, we just wing it. It's kind of it's kind of whatever proper radio protocol is to lower your voice an octave unless you're in a tight spot then it goes up five octaves yeah <laughs> exactly so you and i met at the great minnesota aviation get together um you gave a great presentation and i i'm sorry that this hasn't worked out sooner but i'm really glad to have you on here it's all good so um it sounds like you've listened before um so mm-hmm. you recognize the names maddie and trevor yes i do it's the fast five questions that you've heard before I hope you've thought of an unpopular aviation opinion. And I have. Guess. This one is this one's a good shot across the bow. You're gonna like it. Oh, Ooh, great! Good. I can't wait. <laughs> the controversy. Get, get the hate email ready. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Should we uh, jump into these fast five questions? Go for it. And as you've heard in the past, as you've listened, we do not so secretly judge a little bit. So I hope, don't take <laughs> as, any as you should. Don't take any offense if we uh, get too judgy. So, oh, all no. right. question number one. Um, what do you feel is the best air show venue? Uh, Duluth, Minnesota, D- Duluth Air Show. Oh, Ooh. bucket list item. I've never been. Duluth is I'm... right here. <laughs> I know, but it's not like I've had all this time, Jim. It's Duluth has been there for decades, so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't just build it. All right. Question number two, um, what's the favorite aircraft that you have flown? Cessna 185 Skywagon. Ooh. Classic. Period. 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 No discussion. <laughs> Ow, you make me want to fly hey, one. These two have not judged you too much yet. I mean, I haven't either, but they've good been very- Good judgment. It's good judgment. It's, been, it's still ooh, judgment. Ooh, ah, yeah, it's, it's like positive. Positive reinforcement. <laughs> positive reinforcement. <laughs> All right. On the flip side of that, least favorite aircraft you've ever flown. 152. Oh, 152. All right. <laughs> How do you feel about that, Trevor? Um, they're just so tiny. So if you're by yourself, they're great. Yeah, but if you're not, well, tiny. so I, in all fairness, I have a 150. I have a classic 150 um, that sure. I just bought. Classic uh, means old. Thanks, Jim. You're welcome. Well, Trevor, <laughs> let me let me quantify my answer. I'm six foot two and 250 pounds. If I was normal size, I would love a 150, but I get in it, I got two gallons of gas and this ham sandwich, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing personal against the airframe. It's a very it's, capable airplane, just very, very it's slow. Very nice. Yeah, just, it's, just, it, hey, it's wonderful. It's just I'm too, I'm just not sized for it. That's fair. I am. This may cause some controversy with you and your partners with the State Patrol, but which makes the better mission platform, fixed wing or rotor? Depends on the mission. That seems like a safe to answer. Yeah. Well, we both we have both, and they have both. Yeah. And we and we use all the platforms for different operations. Um, they're they're more shiny and and like to uh, announce all everything that they do, and we're more secretive. How's that up for a little bit of a zinger? There you go. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and the last question we've got for you: favorite aviation book or movie? The final countdown for uh, for the movie. I'm sure a lot of people say Top Gun for the favorite aviation movie. You know, and hey, that's a great movie. But 
I'm going to throw a little bit something different at you. If it, are, is everyone familiar with the Final Countdown? Yep. I've heard of it. I've I heard of it. it. I haven't seen it, though. Okay, it's with it's, it's uh, a, what Martin Sheen, right? Yes. It was Martin, and it, yeah, Martin basically Sheen. Basically, the premise is uh, the aircraft carrier Nimitz goes through Nimitz. a time warp, is put in a position where they can thwart the attack on Pearl Harbor. Oh. Now, Ooh. I'm going to leave it at that because I don't want to ruin it for you, but it is a real good mind-bender movie with lots mm -hmm. of Mitsubishi Zeros and Corsairs. Ooh. It's good stuff. My I'm 100% yep. going to go watch that movie now. Yeah, I just me too. Wrote it down. <laughs> you sold me on it. You sold me it, on it. It's a good one. Well, thanks for playing along. Oh, yeah. Can't wait for the consolation prize. Uh, uh, the consolation prize is you get to talk to us. <laughs> right. Well, now you make that seem valuable. Okay, don't put that. It depends on who you are. Some people really relish this opportunity. Others dread it. Not so much. <laughs> so to get started in the real questions, how about you tell us a bit about your aviation background? I had an uncle that was uh, with the Flying Farmers of Minnesota. It was in uh, near Purim, Minnesota, near Detroit Lakes. Had his own airplane and his own air grass airstrip. Took me for a ride in his Beach Musketeer in, uh, when I was about 11 years old. A little bit young. I remember it, uh, but a little bit young on the specifics. And then he obtained a... Uh, 1966 Cessna, I believe it was a 175. Now, it's not a Cardinal. It's a 175. It's, it's a 172 with a geared engine. They only made them for a couple of years. And so it had, uh, it was a blue collar airplane and it had the Johnson bar for the flaps, right? Sure. So he takes me up and, uh, and we go look at deer and, and the like. And then when he comes in for landing, and this is embarrassing, but I guess I'm going to tell it in front of everybody. <laughs> he um, applies the flaps with the Johnson bar. Now, this is about 1982 or so. And, and I'm looking at that, and we had a, a, a stick shift car at home. And, of course, what did that look like to me? It looked like emergency brake. Okay. I'm not going to tell you how many years I thought, how in the world does an emergency brake help an airplane land? I guess it must, once it hits the grass, I guess the wheels lock up. And so, I mean, I finally, years later, I told him, I said, hey, I told him the story. And he goes, my God, dude, ask the question. You know, don't walk around so foolish. And so along those lines, I would just kind of keep pecking at him. Like, maybe I should fly. Maybe I should fly. And he said, yeah, yeah as long as you can uh, do it for a living and have someone else buy the gas and, and, and quips like that. And he said, it's as easy as driving a tractor. I thought that was foolish. Fast forward, uh, I get hired by the state. I'm single. I have more money than I know what to do with, I felt. And I live four miles from the Crystal Airport. So did I go learn and get a pilot's license? Absolutely not. I waited till I got married and had four kids. <laughs> <laughs> Kept bothering our chief pilot until he finally turned to me and said, stop talking to me until you go get a pilot's license. You obviously want to do it. Just talking to me is not going to do anything get out of here. So like a real man, I called my wife rather than going face to face and saying, uh, you know, I, I need to, I need to learn to fly. So um, I learned to fly at the Anoka airport. Great place to learn. Oh, yeah. yeah, it was, it was wonderful. And so, um, you know, you just, you scrape and fight for every extra dollar and extra, anyone who has an airplane that'll let you fly a safety pilot. And then uh, the state had a really nice program just started for a standby pilot. If you came in with the instrument rating, and um, got a good review from the chief pilot, they would take you on through the commercial rating oh, and well. put you on as a standby nice. pilot. So they put a little skin in the game, but not without you putting in some skin in the game. And that's what brought me to where I am now. Very cool. Sweet. You know, where there's a will, there's a way. Absolutely. We like companies who invest in pilots. Yeah, yeah. So that I means it's tough for government to do sometimes, but yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, I was the first one, and we have had uh, uh, two since since I've gone through, and they have been successful also. So we're three for three. And that makes that makes the upper crust happy. Yeah. So how does the DNR play into aviation? It's primarily used. I would say sixty percent of our flying is our uh, is a uh, survey type of flight, uh, a census type of flight. It's very focused on wildlife, fisheries, and forestry. Sometimes forestry with a fire, but more of the forestry health. We have some very high technical cameras that shoot through the belly of the plane, take pictures of uh, certain type of diseases that come through. Uh, we have the larch beetle, which kills a lot of tamarack trees, which if you have a large swath of dead tamarack trees, you also have now a larger fire danger. Mm -hmm. So staying ahead on forest health is, is important. We do a lot of surveys with telemetry antennas with collared animals. 
everything as small as a bat. I was tasked with one time to go and try and find these bats at the old Arden Hills Ammunition Center. Oh, yeah. Jim, you remember? <laughs> and I go, so you uh -huh. mean to tell me I'm supposed to find a bat in the middle of the Twin Cities? And they said, well, just give it a try. I said, well, you know, it doesn't send off much of a signal. I didn't find it, but, you know, darn, that would have been a feather in the hat if oh, I could yeah. have said that I found a oh, bat yeah. in the metro area. And then, uh, and then of course, the, the, the telemetry goes all the way up to moose, which are much easier because they give out a larger signal. For a fishing, you will, you will count the number of boats on certain lakes, uh, more, the more the popular lakes. That gives you an idea about how many are fishing, how many are, are just cruising, water skiing. That also gives you an idea of how much of the surface of the lake gets pressure throughout the year. Uh, mm. Do we need more parking spots at a boat ramp? Do we need more boat ramps? Do we? Uh, do you tie in the the number of people fishing in a boat with the creel clerks that are working on the water to, to ask people how long you've been fishing today, how much do you have, and you put all that in a blender and you come up with some of your uh, uh, biological reasons why you would have a certain limit on certain fish or closed season oh. on certain fish. In the spring and the fall, we go out and count waterfowl, count ducks, uh, spring uh, nesting survey. The fall migration survey give you an idea of how what the waterfall health are, is like, and, uh, and if, again that helps set up uh, the seasons and what have you for waterfowl. About thirty percent or so is the law enforcement. Now this would be game and fish law enforcement. So you have the illegal taking of of wildlife, illegal taking of fishing, illegal commercial netting, baited deer stands in Minnesota. You cannot use bait to attract uh, deer. Uh, you may find uh, suspicious vehicles in, in certain areas creeping along roads or fields for trespass, loaded firearms, deer shining at night. So you, you have a certain a mix of game and fish enforcement, recreational enforcement, ATVs where they're not supposed to be, snowmobiles going too fast. We have a, a speed limit for snowmobiles in the state of Minnesota. That's uh, 50 miles an hour. And then there is a you help your allied agencies once in a while, uh, you know, the sheriff's departments, police departments, when they have, uh, you know, situations that could use an aircraft and we happen to be nearby. Some search and rescue uh, items are thrown in there. And then the last 5% would probably be uh, our training hours. You know, of course, you have, we work under a low level waiver. So every year we have to do a low level check ride. Uh, you don't want to be playing down at two or 300 feet above wow. the treetops. And, and not having good stick and rudder skills. Uh, that's just not something you want oh, to do. Oh, for sure. And so, uh, you know, that kind of rounds out, rounds out the, the flying that we do. It's very unique. It's, it's a, I guess you would say, niche uh, type of flying. Mm -hmm. But it's a very satisfying. At the, at the end of the day, you either have a fistful of data for biologists and researchers, or you have a fistful of evidence and data for law enforcement officers. In, in law enforcement, sometimes it's tough to look back at the end of the day and see what you accomplished. It's felt like when we put their plane back in the barn, safe, and, and we have that data, that's a good feeling. That's a good mm -hmm. use of public funds. Okay, I have a question. It's only kind of relevant. What is the current health status of the particular waterfowl known as the Canadian Lots goose? of <laughs> Canada geese. I... Lots of Canada geese. I know they're Canada. It's That's Canada fine. goose, but the ones that go honk, I'm... eh? Honk, eh? Mm -hmm. it, yes. <laughs> I've I've heard the them very called, same. I've heard them called uh, hissing cobra chickens. Uh, yes. Harp, hissing cobra uh, chickens. Uh, you, there's lots of. Yep, I've heard that. Oh, that's a good one too. You know, I, I do remember one. when they were. Uh, I grew up in Rochester, Minnesota, and the giant Canada goose was thought it was to be to be extinct, and then they came over to this lake in Rochester, and here, here's these giant Canada geese. Well, this is great. Let's spread the love. And many other cities said, well, we'd love to have some geese. And of course, they, they adapt to human activity very well. And uh, so they've almost become yeah. an issue in certain areas. So what is the size of the Department of Natural Resources flight section? We have four fixed wing. We have three helicopters. And we're probably going to right size that a little bit. We would like to, uh, we could shrink the number of helicopters down to two and shrink the number of airplanes from six to uh, four, but with the caveat that we would like to upgrade uh, some of the aircraft, including with new camera systems. Sure. So maybe work in a little bit smarter, have a little bit leaner. What kind of aircraft do you fly? So we have two American Champion Scout, and we have four uh, 185 Skywagons. We have a, a newer MD-500 uh, helicopter, Magnum Ooh. PI special. 
And then we, we actually run, still run an Enstrom for ADB. And, uh, and then we have what we kind of started our whole rotary program. We still run a military surplus OH-58. And that's, really? that's what I learned to fly on. Really? Uh, yeah, it was a Kiowa. Jeez. So it, it's, a, it's a very capable fleet. Oh, we fly all tailwheels. They all go on skis in the wintertime. Two of the 185s go on amphib floats in the summertime. And then the, the helicopters, the MD does is our heavy lifter. That will do a fish stocking. That will do a Bambi bucket for fire. And the Enstrom is used for, uh, we, use, we spray cattails. We have some hybrid cattails that are overtaking a fair amount of our marshes. You wouldn't be able to tell that they're hybrid because they look like a regular cattail, but they're from the coastal areas. And coastal um, cattails are used to tidal bounces. And so they don't die off during droughts. So you're having cattails choking out these large bays, which are normally oh. open water for waterfowl. So we have some spray booms and, and we've been spraying some of these uh, cattails. That that project just started a couple of years ago. Huh. Very hmm. cool. So it's very, very unique type of type of flying. We asked earlier, obviously, about which is better for, you know, the best mission platform. But I think that these amount of unique things you guys do that's you're right it really depends on the mission i suppose it does we are uh we're looking at getting a, you know it's hard to put a flare cam or i keep saying flare a, a gimbal mounted camera because there's many mm-hmm. manufacturers flare just happens to be one of them there's west cam and but there's no mounts made for a cessna 185 so we're probably going to be going to a tricycle gear uh aircraft for that camera system and then you know Anyone can fly the 206, and then maybe you can work your way into the into the tailwheel of the of the 185. Not that it's difficult; it's just different. You know, it's it's just different. Every time I go to a, a conference, of course, the Textron people are there. Textron <laughs> Aviation, yeah. And uh, of course, I try and find the oldest one there, and so I could jump and scream on them. I said, you know, when will you start rebuilding building the 185 again? And and of course, <laughs> they give me the the pat answer about you know part 23 and blah, blah, blah. And of course, I'm, you know, I got him in the, in the, in the double world wrestling found uh, federation chokehold, you know, you're a liar, you're a liar, you know, <laughs> beating him in the submission. And so finally, one time I, I, I'd given the guy enough grief. I said, okay, I'm, I'm just kind of tongue in cheek. It's, it's such a beautiful aircraft. It's so capable. He goes, that's all right. He goes, uh, I go, what, is that the most egregious you've ever had someone come up to you? He goes, no, he said the Cardinal owners, the Cardinal. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I've heard training that. Order time. Uh, it's a cardinal or it's nothing. And I thought a, a cardinal owner I, here. I thought I was rather being rather aggressive. And they said, Nope, you got to get behind those folks. <laughs> that was kind of funny. You know, it's, it's kind of funny because my 150 is, is painted like a cardinal, like a traditional cardinal, the red and white cardinal. The, the, the true story. Now I have to preface a lot of this stuff by saying true story, because there's another term I would normally use if it wasn't a podcast, right? That you, you yeah. start a story out with. Yeah, but we'll go with true story. True story. Our <laughs> American champion scouts are blue and, and yellow. They look exactly like the blue angel color scheme. Hmm. And so I pull into the Duluth airport. Now in Duluth, there's nothing there but Cirrus. Oh yeah, the belly button, right? Everyone has one, mm-hmm. and uh, and the F sixteens. And so I pull in there, and the line guy looks at me kind of funny. He's like, "Well, what's this?" I go, "Well, this is a blue blue angel's trainer." <laughs> and of course he really cocked his head he goes what, what do you mean a blue angels trainer i said well you know as soon as they master that jet then they go into this a real plane because anyone can get out of out of trouble with what fifty thousand pounds of thrust but here i only have 180 horses and it's tube and fabric you gotta mm-hmm. fly and yeah. of course then he was just really perplexed i'm like just fill it up it was it was a, <laughs> a thrill attempt at humor so i guess i have another question about just the different platforms. Are you all like cross trained to fly fixed and rotor wing then, or is it, are you split or how does that work with you guys? No, uh, there's only uh, three of us that are rotary. Everyone else is fixed wing. All the rotary folks, two of us are, are dual rated. Uh, well, I suppose triple rated because I'm a, I'm a drone pilot uh, technically mm-hmm. too, although I, I don't actively, you know, use drones. But, uh, and then our, our third newer helicopter pilot, we're putting her through the fixed wing transition right now. It's kind of nice. My partner was a uh, instructor pilot for the National Guard for uh, OH-58s and Cobras. And okay. so he taught, we, he was able to teach me in-house, which is great, right? And so we have another one of our, our pilot who was a longtime CFI in Minnesota. And we just, we just hired him a couple years ago. And so we have now have that person in-house to do the training. So 
it's great to go outside for training from time to time, truly, but it's great when you can keep it in house too. So you keep the costs down doing it in house with your own aircraft. But then uh, every once in a while we do go out and go to factory schools and, and bring in instructors to get uh, another, a third, you know, view, shall we say. We did start our SMS program, safety management system. We were the first in the state to have that. And uh, I used to go to quite a few conferences with this uh, public safety aviation uh, group, a great, great uh, professional group of uh, public safety aviators, fire, police, uh, natural resource and the like. And so we learned about safety management system and how simple they don't have to be complex, just make them simple. And so uh, we've implemented that and it really helped out a lot. It helped out a lot to be able to take a different view at uh, the safety of the program. You know, you're you're not eliminating risk, you're you're minimizing risk. And and then you're justifying the risk. You know, is this something that's that's worth the, the minimal risk? Yes. OK, we're going to do it and do it the best we can. Is this something worth the uh, getting to be marginal or, or substantial risk? Uh, no, it's not. OK, well, then we're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. And it allows it to put it in a format that administrators, non-aviators can can understand. Because when you are in public safety aviation, eventually your 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 upper crust administrators are not pilots. And their eyes right. can glaze over really quick when we start talking about FARs and FAA and, and VOR. I mean, that we can acronym them to death. But they do understand that everything we need is expensive. Mm -hmm. And so... You are very. You learn to be to put it into general terms. Your needs. You make sure that the needs are needs and the wants are wants, mm -hmm. so that they they don't feel like they've been duped, because everything you know does have a price tag. Mm -hmm. And they do like the safety management system that we've we've had, and and we've you know we've had a, a great knock on wood. We've had a great uh, great run. It's our 75th anniversary this year. We started in 1947. We did have a pilot that got into a, a spiral spin. It was a dual fatality in 1999. Sad situation. We identified some items and learned from it and moved on. You know, again, it's not without without risk, but we do, you know, you do minimize the risk the best that you can. Us, like everyone else, uh, you know, we're gonna. All our pilots are old. Um, almost all of our pilots are old. And so we're, we're trying to, we try to hire from within. That doesn't always work. Uh, bringing people from the outside isn't the worst thing, but you're immersed with dual culture, right? You're immersed with state culture and natural resource culture. And every job and every agency has a culture. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's a steep learning curve. It's not impossible. But we are, you know, we have been trying to get in there and fight for the, the people that are interested in, in flying. I think our pay is, is very comparable. Uh, the benefits are, are quite good. Uh, you know, you get a take home uh, squad. Uh, you, you know, you are a licensed officers. So you are expected to do law enforcement duties, albeit not as much as as the people that are in the field. You know, it's good equipment. I, I guess I just I have a heart for it. So, of course, I'm going to paint it rosy. Is it perfect? Of course not. But uh, if, if you like to fly varied missions, you know, the, this is something, natural resource aviation is something to look at. I tell you folks, just tonight, I found out that the National Park Service has a, an aviation airplane pilot job open on Lake Mead. They can't find anyone within the National Park Service that is qualified or is interested in taking this pilot job. It's a brand wow. new 206. Jeez. Its focus is fire, but they also do law enforcement, running supplies, search and rescue. It's a GS-12 position. It starts at like... I don't know, 85 grand to 103 grand pay scale. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this yeah. is a good job. Yeah. 1,500, no 1500 hours. Uh, you have to have 1,500 hours, 500 as a B plane, 100 within the last 12 months. You can find it on usajobs.gov. Why are people not taking this job is beyond me. Yeah. Like, nothing against the airline pilots because God bless them. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't want to be an airline pilot. I never have. There are a lot of people who don't. Right. Truly. And so, you know, if you want to be a, a freight uh, a pilot, boy, I almost let something slip there. Uh, a, fr a freight pilot, you know, God bless you. Uh, online sales had their best Monday ever. And so really? but oh, I don't want to be a that. freight pilot. Right. Yeah. 
And so you get someone that really wants to be connected to the resource and, and still and still use aviation. This is the this is the arena for you. We don't give a damn if you're a man or a woman, short, tall, purple. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I, as I tell people when I go to the classrooms and talk, an aircraft doesn't care about your gender. An mm-hmm. aircraft will respect you or hurt you based on your skill. Yeah. Amen. That mixed with you have to play good in a sandbox. Because let's face it, it's a small world, right? We're a small oh, yeah. population. If you're a jerk, it's going to spread. <laughs> and you may be really have good stick, as they say. But honestly, if you're a pain in the butt, those jobs might be tough to come by. You know, and so I really try to tell people your people skills are almost as important as your as your stick and rudder. How was that for a soapbox? You know, that was kind of a soapbox uh, routine there that I gave you. But, you know, I feel strongly about it. It's it's a great aviation market. It's a great aviation niche. And in in truly in all of aviation, you know, we talk about getting, you know, all kinds of people in aviation. Man, there's room for you at the table. Yeah. Just come over here. But I mean, that, that's just the reality of it is that we have we have a huge assortment of jobs that are available. That's not just airlines. It's not just corporate flying. It's it's law enforcement. It's, you know, conservation, you know, like, like yourself. I think people just don't know about it. Yep. I think the more we get the word out, like we're doing right now, yep. I think right. the, the more pilots can be like, ah, that's what I want to do. So to the aspiring um, conservation pilot, do you have to be um, a conservation officer first before you're eligible for that position? Um, what are some other qualifications you would have to meet in order to become a pilot? So in Minnesota, uh, you ha- you, you, we do have uh, licensed conservation officer pilots. So you have to be a conservation officer. We do have a couple civilian slots. I don't know how long those will stick around. Um, but we do have two civilian spots that uh, are, are just strictly for surveys only. But that can change. Um, in, in Minnesota, our department has a program called a CO, Conservation Officer Prep Program. So if you, you have a two or a four year degree in, in anything from an accredited college, we'll hire you, put you through the law enforcement schooling and then you go through our Conservation Officer Academy, and we thought maybe that's how we will get pilots someday, because someone will come in with all the hours and all of the aviation experience, and they have the background that qualifies them for a for an officer spot, and they have the heart for it. That might be another way to get non-traditional people in. Otherwise, yeah, you have to be a you have to be a licensed officer. Now, that's for the state of Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Other states are all over the board. Some have licensed officer pilots. Some have civilian pilots. The Fish and Wildlife Service, majority of their pilots have to be uh, biologists. So you have to have Ooh. a four-year degree or a master's degree in, in biology as a researcher. Um, I talked to the chief ranger in Alaska. He, is, he, he has some of the most beautiful areas in, in, the, in the world. And he has super cubs on skis and on floats. And they're for licensed National Park Service uh, rangers. He can't find anyone. He can't find anyone to take the job. That that's just blows my mind. Who's who wouldn't go do that, right? And so, uh, you know, it it just depends on the agency you're looking for. I want to go back on something quick. Um, in that CO or conservation officer responsibilities too, are there times when you guys aren't flying that you have to do that conservation enforcement type of work too? You know, you don't have to. Okay, I choose to because. It's in my blood. I did it for 20 years. You, you should get out there with the field folks and, and, and learn about the work that stay honed on the work that they do because it helps you in the air uh, knowing what information benefits them. Sure. You know, I mean, the, we talk about, you know, the knowledge of the, of, of the species and, and hunting. If you're flying along, you should never be deadheading in our type of work. By the way, ours is strictly VFR. I mean, I'll do an IFR approach when we're when some clouds come in, but if it's an IFR day, I'm not going up because I can't see the ground. Right. Sure. So if I'm flying along and I'm, maybe I'm going to see a wetland impact, someone who's draining illegally draining or filling a wetland. Maybe I'm going to see a cluster of geese uh, in a, in a pond or uh, mallards and the, and the water is really turbulent and muddy and all the rest of the little ponds are clear. So what's going on there? 
chances are someone's throwing corn into that pond, illegally baiting the pond. You have the makings for an excellent waterfowl case. And hmm. so to note that stuff is you have to spend time on the field with the field officers, engaging with hunters and anglers, knowing how those investigations happen so that when you up in the air, and I call it putting the puzzle together, uh, you look down and go, hey, wait a minute, something's a little bit interesting or something's a little bit different here. Take a picture, GPS coordinate, and uh, and now we've, you know, we're making a case that might not have been made. That is so cool. I, yeah, I didn't think about that part. I have I to say, have, the but... last, in the last hour, I've learned so much. Me too. Wow. I, I haven't even gotten into 5% of my funny stories, but I'm trying to debate <laughs> on which ones I can tell. <laughs> All of them. I, all, I have just less than three years of retirement. When I get within six months, you know, boy, you know, we, we could put on a heck of a podcast. Oh, the yeah. floodgates oh, yeah. will open then, I bet, I imagine. Ooh, uh, open season, <laughs> one could say. Nice pun, Maddie. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> oh, there, there's, a, you know, when you land a land behind uh, on the water to check people, I'll pull up to boats and have them pull underneath the wing and check them for their fishing stuff. And, you know, more times than not, I, I, you know, if you land a little, uh, eighth of a mile away and you just idle up to them, uh, they don't even hear you. Also, they'll look up and, of course, the, the surprise is there. My personal best <laughs> is when I stopped the person, I was on Facebook within 20 seconds. A girl I went to high school with sent to me, to me and goes, hey, is, he, or is it a tough day at the, uh, at the job there, Jason? Uh, 20 <laughs> seconds. I've been on more Facebook posts than I can shake a stick at. <laughs> and you come up the airplane and ask people to check their fishing license. And you know what? I've written tickets and knock on wood, no one's ever complained. They sometimes want to get up on the floats and have their picture taken with the airplane. And that's fine. <laughs> uh, again, you know, we're not talking crimes of the century. We're talking crimes of opportunity. Uh, yeah. Someone just didn't think they're going to get checked and didn't get a fishing license using extra lines uh, over limit. Yes, they're important. Don't get me wrong. But we are not talking about the crime of the century. So a fair amount of them just say, hey, you caught me. And son of a buck, I never thought I'd get caught like this. Can I have a picture? Now, why not, right? <laughs> now, every time I go fishing, I'm going to get really nervous every time I hear an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> Whether I'm doing anything wrong or not. <laughs> right. Well, in the fall, every low-flying airplane, the deer hunters assume is the DNR, checking yep. their, mm -hmm. their stance for bait. So yep. general aviation actually is quite the force multiplier for us i suppose um, yeah <laughs> you know it, it, wow you guys were over here weren't you with that you know red and blue plane well we don't have a red and blue plane but sure sometimes they sure and sometimes they go sure you don't as 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 jim you know there's there's always war stories right and so you love it's, war stories are best sprinkled you know not not story <laughs> after story after story so i've i've always enjoyed your format of this show of being able to you know we'll throw a little war story here and then we'll, we'll throw some you know, how do you become this this pilot and how do you become this position? I'm, and I'm telling you, uh, again, if, if you want it bad enough, you can have it. It's none of us are Maverick. None of us are Chuck Yeager. We're all quite active in the wings program, the FAA wings program. It's a great program to keep your proficiency. There isn't a one of us that hasn't called. I'm talking with the pilots I fly with that call with and say, you know what? I really goobered my last three landings. And these are guys with two, 3,000 hours. I really goobered my landing, and a 185 is not something to be toyed with if you're starting to get lazy on landing. Can you mm -hmm. come down and, and fly with me for a, a half a day? I'll buy lunch. And we do have, a, a, we get two hours a month to do training. Um, and so sometimes the bank could do four hours one month and, and, and such. But the point is, is that everyone is honest with themselves and honest with each other, none of us is God's gift to aviation. Sometimes I just get in a funk. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you personally, for me, it's IFR flight, IFR approaches. I am legal. I am nowhere near proficient. My aircraft is an incredibly capable IFR platform. I have uh, mainly all steam gauges, but I have two dual G5, carbon G5s. Nice. I have a 530 WAS. And I have a, uh, an autopilot, I can't remember, something 55X uh, kind of escapes me. But point being is it, it, it does, the weakest link is certainly the meat servo behind the, the yoke, right? That'd be meat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I will make myself go out with, with one of our 
uh, other pilots who's been the very avid instructor and, and let them beat me up and let them make me look and sweat and look like a fool because you, you have to be able to identify everyone has a weak spot. And, that, and I think that's important in professional aviation is to admit that you bet I got some swagger. I've got X number of years and X number of hours. But by golly, sometimes that that trouble spot creeps in. Mm -hmm. Maybe you folks have experienced it in your own personal life or maybe you've seen students that come back and go, yeah. what's going on? If, if you listen to the last episode, I mentioned power off 180s were my nemesis the last several months doing my instrument or my commercial training. It was, I hated them. I just, I couldn't get it to click. I finally did. I passed my check ride, but at the same time, yeah. the build up to it was, and I think it was just that, you know, you get in your head sometimes. Yep. But I think what you said is important too, because um, I was talking with a coworker whose daughter is going through her primary training right now. And she just did her first solo. If Anna's listening to this, congratulations on your first solo. All um, right. Anna. But that's a question that he's asked about, you know, she sometimes, you know, talks about her landings and I'm like, oh, I, that's not going to get better. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we all have landings. It's like you, you started this off, you know, you could just have goobered your last three landings or you make one of those landings where you bounce and now you're proficient for 90 days. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we've all done it, but I think that you raise a really good point that, and it goes back to what I was told, you know, after I got my primary license of, this is a license to learn. We have to keep challenging ourselves and putting ourselves in those situations to learn, to improve, to, you know, check that ego. Thank you, Trevor, <laughs> to check yeah. our egos. Yeah. Big time. Just Big last time. month, I had my first tail strike with a student. It was my fault. <laughs> I have almost 500 yeah. hours. Do you want me to include that or should I cut it, Maddie? I don't care. <laughs> I, I've owned it by this point. My bosses didn't fire me clearly. Oh, in fact, good. the way he, he thought it was awesome. Because I was so dead on center line, I scraped up the the tar in between the the concrete slabs with the with the tie yeah. ring. A little bit of lemonade with that lemon. There you go. <laughs> right. yeah. Funny because we call that aircraft the lemon because it was uh, it was in maintenance for so long. So Funny. anyway, <laughs> so which kind of brings us to our very next question. It's not very good segue, but Maddie's most rewarding flight is tail strike. What would you say your most rewarding thing about the kind of flying that you do? I, I should be able to, to pinpoint it. I, I can't. You know, there's some context. We, we definitely uh, one time this spring was involved with a situation that uh, truly did rescue some people that were in some very bad situation in the Boundary Waters. That was oh, I think in I heard about conjunction that. With, the, with the State Patrol helicopter, um, working in tandem agencies with a great result uh, that that worked out really nice. There was um, last winter a found just not too far north of Brainerd, an unreported feedlot that had a, a, a broken barrier and, and, and failed to report uh, a lot of raw manure that was going into a creek area that was feeding a very popular uh, recreational lake. Oh. And, you know, when you're when you're deadheading, you should always be looking outside the window because you never know what you're going to see. Mm -hmm. And um, which is kind of unique because they spend more time looking at the ground than in the air. Now that's, I'll, I'll put that in context. I do <laughs> see and avoid, but you, you got to look down. That's where the work is. Right. Yeah. And so I was really pleased that, that we, that we uh, got the situation, you know, remedied with that. And we're not looking at, you know, we really got a great penalty out of it. Yeah, I mean, that, that happens too, but you, you stop the pollution. A lot of people pay a lot of money in property tax for, for good water quality and love my farmers and stuff, but you can't, you can't have that. Minnesota's moose population is, you know, in question. And so for the last how many years, been involved with moose capture for collaring. And that's, you know, when you, when you have a, a operation that you have to wait for it to get warm enough, warms up to 20 below before you can start. Um, <laughs> You know, that's really, and I said, why do we wait till 20 below? And the guy heading it up, he was like, well, I don't know. We had to pick a number. 20 below seemed to be good, you know, <laughs> because <laughs> it just doesn't get much warmer than that in January. Uh, to be able to do that operation, get everyone back safe, and then you start doing that research 
and none of it's worth dying over, but you know, it's work that has to be done. So when we were done with that, all the birds are put away and warm. Yeah, we, you know, we gave ourselves a pat on the back. Two of our, uh, our older civilian uh, pilots, they both were National Guard helicopter partners. One was a forester, one was a fisheries technician, and we brought them on as uh, pilots. But, you know, in the hangar, when they got the helicopters put away, they get, they, you hear these 60-year-old guys hugging each other. They were so happy that they got the job done and it was safe. Our passengers were happy because let's face it, everyone watches, you know, the public monies. A lot of people really watch the DNR money, a lot of accusations of, you know, waste. But, you know, helicopters aren't cheap, but they get the job done. They get the job done best of anything that's out there. Mm -hmm. And and I thought that was real touching. I still like that to that to this day. I like that. And I'm not a hugger. (laughs) <laughs> that's awesome they came over to me and i'm like that's all right i'll uh and arms like a fist, fist bump what kind of advice would you give to aspiring pilots there's no one route to these jobs you hear people say well which college do you have to go to well there's no one college that you have to go to if it's accredited program you know that's a start but we all have a degree I know these jobs that require a degree, you have one to apply or you're going to get aced out real quick, yeah. but they aren't going to, okay, there's the degree set in the pile. Tell me, who are you? Who are you as a person? What, where are your values uh, as far as, as, as work goes? And, you know, really have that courage to, to get out there and ask the question and, and know that you're going to be told no a hundred times, but that one time is extra sweet. You know, you hear these stories about these uh, famous celebrities uh, that have, you you hear their backstory. It's phenomenal, right? Dr. Seuss, Theodore Geisel, he's rejected by what, 20 publishers? Basically thrown out of half of them, saying this is the stupidest crap I've ever seen. He finds one publisher, and now everyone knows Dr. Seuss, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Michael Jordan gets cut from his high school basketball team. Wouldn't you love to be that coach nowadays? When they come around and say, hey, aren't you the guy that cut Michael Jordan? I mean, how sick and tired is he of, of hearing that? <laughs> <laughs> and so you hear the backstories. Nothing ever comes easy. And there was a really great saying one time that said, courage doesn't always roar like a lion. Courage mm-hmm. is sometimes that small voice at the end of the day that says, you know what? I'm going to try again tomorrow. Whether it's just I'm, I, I can only afford an hour this week to, to, to rent a plane. Uh, by the way, been there, done that. Yep to uh, uh, I had a, a tail strike as a CFI and you, you feel a little sheepish, right? And, and any longtime CFI is going to say, all right, well, that was a, you were about due for something like that. What are you going to do with that incident? Are you just going to sit there and go, well, I guess I, I don't count anymore? Or are you going to get back up the next day, learn from it, move on? You know, the choice is yours. Well, the reality is, is airplanes, if, if you don't respect them, they're going to eat your lunch. You know, mm-hmm. that that's yeah. that's the that's the reality of it, and we see it time and time again. So that's that, that's very that that's a very potent piece of advice. When you coach someone, especially when they have an incident, a ground loop or or something like that, you know, there's some there's some other you know fairly okay pilots out there that have bent metal. Uh, Chuck Yeager, yep. Charles Lindbergh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Bob Hoover. You know these fair average pilots out there. <laughs> so I'm not advocating that you go and bend metal and just walk away and say, okay, sirrah, sirrah. But at the same time, it's not game over. Sure. Unless, of course, you did something most horrifically, feloniously stupid. But well, yeah. Like, like flying into a Bravo without calling. Or Trevor Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> no relation. There you go. <laughs> yeah, you got to put that out there. People get confused. Nowadays you do. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's such a potent question, right? Mm-hmm. Because... Yeah. If there's one thing that I love is is seeing, I don't care if they're young or middle aged, if if someone's running for that dream, and if if it wasn't for me, years later asking my uncle, just how the hell does an emergency brakes you know help an airplane land? <laughs> I, I might still be 50 years old and thinking an emergency brake you know helps an airplane land, and he mm-hmm. he looks at me, he goes, dude, you gotta ask the question, mm-hmm. and not 20 years later, or I mean, 20 right. months later. <laughs> right. Well, I, I think I think that's very poetic how you brought that full circle. Yeah. 
Hey, Jim, is it time? All right, Trevor. No, you're <laughs> you're you're the best at asking it. So let's bring it. Let's bring it. You're you're ready for this. I'm ready Man. for it. All righty, sir. Please share with us your unpopular aviation opinion. <laughs> Simple airplanes make better pilots. Take Simple. your glass cockpits and go away. <laughs> Ooh, that's a big shot across the bow. It could be, uh, yeah. Not, <laughs> not me teaching in brand new Cessnas. <laughs> Take your nose wheels and go away. <laughs> oh, that's going to hurt some feelings down in Texas, oh, but he's yeah. not in the Midwest. <laughs> now, of course, I'm being facetious. I'm hoping you were you were looking for a, a level of that. Oh, but yeah. I love a J3 Cub. I love a Super Cub that has the bare minimum gauges and forces you to use your eyes and your butt and to know what angle of attack means and coefficient of lift oh, yeah. and what that airplane is doing. I'm I'm being very tongue in cheek because everything that I told you that you could take away is, is are all wonderful tools that are making aviation safer, safer and better. But and this is a big but that simple airplane that the three buddies or the three girlfriends that are working overtime to keep going in that little grass strip brother that's flying mm -hmm. that's that's exactly it i have to agree 100 percent. i love that answer i want to be a better pilot it's on my list to be a better <laughs> pilot is that what <laughs> you just be a said <laughs> yes specifically in this vein like yes i want to okay. be a better pilot always but <laughs> What is high on my list is getting in, in an aircraft like that and really getting truly good at flying. We'll see how many, how much hate email and, and the tweets you get <laughs> off my uh, arrogant. <laughs> well, what I was going to bring up is that there's so many videos out there right now of all these aviation YouTubers upgrade my panel this, upgrade my panel that, and I'm sure that there's some companies that I won't name in case they, you know, in case they want to sponsor us. Um, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> um, that are just throwing money at these things because they know that these aviation YouTube channels are some of them are really blowing up. But, mm -hmm. um, but that's that's a lot of what I'm seeing on YouTube right now. It's just these upgrading panel videos, and I think that there's something to be said about the good old steam cages sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm all about well. situational awareness, but there's something about steam gauges that's just a lot less distracting. Sometimes I just turn off my students' G1000. It's like you don't need this for what we're doing. No, we're just we're just flying right now. Yeah. Yeah, there's a difference when we when we train we're flying otherwise we're working and there is a huge huge difference oh yeah so today yep. when we it's a training day we're flying the rest of the days we're working jim mm -hmm. you don't pay a policeman to drive a car we don't pay a dnr pilot to fly a plane it sounds very very odd but it's true we're paying yeah. us to work mm -hmm. on, on a training day that's the day we fly mm -hmm. I like that. Again, that's very poetic. I like that. <laughs> well, there you go. I should get my wife over here and see how sensitive I could be. <laughs> <laughs> just have her please. listen to this and go, see? <laughs> you, I'm yeah, sensitive. you just can't carve out all my good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I certainly appreciate you coming on and having the patience to stick with us to, to make it this far to... <laughs> To come on this, the podcast in the first place, so oh, it's I, could, uh, I, I could do this for hours. I mean, there's 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 some stories, there's some anecdotes, there's some training angles. I don't want to smother too much about uh, items. I I would I would welcome a, a shot back again if you want to. Oh, that very well may well happen. Oh yeah, yeah, that will part two may well happen since you brought yeah. it up. And we really uh, appreciate your time very much. So tonight, mm -hmm. well, we hope to do it again sometime. Absolutely. Oh, well, you have a great rest of your well, night. All right, sir. You take care. Thanks. You too. Thank you. Have a wonderful Thanks night. Thanks so much for being on. All yeah. right. Take care. Bye-bye. Right, bye. Bye. The Midwestern goodbye we made didn't it. take as long as I thought it was going to. I like him a lot. Yeah. He was very entertaining and very, like, I was drawn to that right away when I watched him speak and I'm, I'm like, I got to talk to this guy. So, I mean, I first interacted with him last summer and I'm like, I got to get him on the podcast when we were still really new. Mm -hmm. um, so I pitched this to him and then, you know, everything going on with work and everything going on with our personal lives, it just hadn't happened yet. So yeah. the fact that he, like, he was still like, I, I messaged him again the other day and he was still excited about the idea coming on. And clearly, I mean, he's a listener and I, yeah. 
it's that's so cool. Yeah, well, I think that uh, means a lot. And that I means a lot to me personally. It does to me too. It's that's cool. I love when we can bring people on that listen to the podcast too, and they can come and contribute. Yeah. Oh, I mean, hi, it's, Anna. It's, Maddie says hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> I think Hannah likes you more than me, Maddie. Well, she only sees me once every couple of weeks. So I would like me to, if I only saw myself once every couple of weeks too. Here, let me unplug this for a second. Oh. (laughs) There, now you can hear Maddie. Hi, Maddie. Hi, how you doing? (laughs) Good. Yeah. Yeah, She she thinks you're the coolest. She does. Aw, I'm not, but you're sweet. (laughs) Are you going to get Hannah her pilot's license, Maddie? Yeah. You're going to fly with me, right? Yeah, of course. Good. Do you fly with dad? No, she won't even fly with me. She <laughs> wants to fly with you. <laughs> this might well, actually make a good it pilot, the podcast, you know? actually. She was talking about, I want to be on the podcast. So now we found a way <laughs> oh, to get good. her in here. <laughs> there you go. I just have to I have to bribe her with flying lessons. Yes. yes. That's that's how that works. I, I have an airplane you might, you might be able to use. Uh... <laughs> I may pay. I, I might have an airplane. Really I'm that. right here. <laughs> Hannah, Hannah's going to read now. Bye. Okay. Have fun reading, Bye. Hannah. Thank you. And Jason just texted me. He goes, damn it. That was fun. So Aww. that's awesome. We are, I, I'm like, we are absolutely going to have you on again. So, yes. I, oh my gosh. Yeah. He's such a laid back guy that I think he'd be great to have on again in the future. I'm sure he's got lots more to talk to us about. Coming up in a couple of weeks is going to be our one year anniversary of this podcast, you guys. Holy heck. It's been a fun year. It really has. I'll say. Lots has happened. And I think yes. for our, our anniversary episode, we're trying, and I know I've said this before and not come through with it, but we're going to try to do a live episode. And I think we're going to try to get on some of our great guests from the past to maybe relive some of those moments that we've had in the last year and just thank them and thank everyone for their part in our success as a podcast for the last year. What's in our next episode, Jim? Our next episode for anyone who's watched a single minute of Sporty's pilot instructional DVDs. Oh, that's Rob right. Ryder. That's right. From Sporty's DVDs, as well as the show center podcast and a little tiny podcast called I learned about flying from that put on by flying magazine. Oh, when he does all sorts of air shows all over the country. Um, the one, the only Rob Ryder. So I am so excited to talk to him. Uh, we That's talked to him. Be really fun. I talked to him on the phone about a week and a half ago, and just such a down to earth guy. And I think it's going to be a great episode. Oh, I'm excited. This I will be too. fun. <laughs> Super excited for that. That's coming in our next episode. Till next time. See ya. See ya. See ya. Flightjet five thirty six contact Minneapolis Center one three two point three five today. Thanks so much for joining us on the Flying Midwest Podcast. Until next time, podcast service terminated, Squawk VFR, frequency change approved. Good day. Um, in about seven minutes, I have to go take my casserole. I'm sorry. I have to take my I hot dish. I beg your pardon. Out. I'm my editing. parents don't know, I swear. <laughs> well, that's going in then. No! <laughs> How's it spelled? O G E M A. Ogama. Ogama? Yeah. Ogaboga. Ogaboga? Is that what you said? <laughs> Oogie Boogie. Yes. <laughs> so you've got a great, great memory, uh, Trevor. Uh, we could use someone like you. Unless we do something stupid, then we don't like people. Like you. <laughs> <laughs> because you don't you don't forget which is which is kind of funny and this kind of goes goes into a story that i promised jim i wouldn't uh i wouldn't rabbit hole but um you can't keep that promise i don't know why i bother asking I <laughs> oh no i was sticking my hands under my armpits i'm cold <laughs> <laughs> for evidence did i miss something there I, 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 I like, did a, a, oh, a gesture. I was just tucking if, my hands in. <laughs> if you did, you're going to hear it again when we broadcast this one, because that's going to get hurt again. <laughs> no. <laughs> Why must the blooper reel be against me? Because you keep saying silly things. <laughs> no. Have you had uh, folks from other public safety agencies, uh, their pilots on your show? I, I haven't caught any. Not yet. No. No. You're okay. the first. 
All right. Well, Congrats. see, you got a low, you got a low standard. It's nowhere but up now. <laughs> I agree. I didn't also want to say that's awesome because that was my initial thought. That's yeah. I concur. That's incredible. <laughs> You're not supposed to ask a lady what she weighs. Unless you're doing weights and balance. You have balance. to in aviation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Controversial himself, Trevor Norman. I don't know what no. she's talking about, Trevor. <laughs> hey, don't be hating. Just because you're right, you're right. No. I mean, they have already done a flight test, but I don't know what that what the prototype looks like. It's on the <clears> internet. <throat> it has to be true. That's right. That's how the internet works, Maddie. Right. I get that. I don't, I don't think I ever called him by name. Mr. Jensen? I think that's what I said, Mr. actually. Mr. Officer Jensen? <laughs> Jet Jensen. Mr. Mr. Officer, specifically. I think they prefer to go by green jeans because of their green pants. Green I jeans, feel like that's um, going to get me in trouble if I ever say that. I think they'll also respond to Crappie Cop or Rabbit Rangers or another <laughs> one that I'm going to keep to myself. Da, my Atish. Well, it's bye. been fun. Did you say bye? That's all he said. That's not how we end this podcast, Trevor, and you know it. Hey, don't be hating. <laughs> <laughs>